Hello and welcome back to Algebra, the video series where we talk a lot about algebraic constructions like groups, rings and fields. And indeed, in today's part 14, we will talk about some special groups called cyclic groups. And here at the beginning, I can already give you a short definition. A cyclic group can be generated by just one element. In that sense, these groups are not very complicated, but still interesting enough to study. I'm really thankful because your support makes it possible that I can create such math videos. Moreover, being a supporter is also beneficial for you because you can download additional material with the link in the description. Okay, then let's immediately start by recalling our group S3 from the last video. We've talked about this a lot and you might remember it's simply the symmetry group of an equilateral triangle. And now it turns out that we have exactly six symmetry operations, so six elements in our group S3. However, we only need two elements to generate the whole group. For example, we can fix one rotation operation A and one reflection operation B and then we get all the elements back with the combinations of A and B. So we would write that S3 is generated by A and B. How this works in practice for S3 we have seen in the last video, but now obviously we need a general definition for that. So the question is, what does it actually mean to say that a group is generated by some elements? And the best definition for that is to consider all possible subgroups that contain these elements. So let's take a general group G and also a subset of elements. And maybe a good name for this subset is a capital S. So it can be just any subset, we don't need an additional structure, just a collection of elements. So as an example, maybe as before, we could say that S only contains two elements. And then we can just look at the subgroups in G that are actually bigger than S. This means the elements of S should lie completely in our subgroup U. Therefore, this U has to satisfy two conditions. First, it has to be a subgroup of G. And second, the set S is also a subset in U. And now the idea is simply to consider all possible subgroups that satisfy these conditions. And then obviously what we can construct is the intersection of all these subgroups U. So by putting in more subgroups we can get smaller and smaller, but in the end this intersection still contains the whole set S. And therefore what remains in this intersection is what we call the subgroup that is generated by S. And I can tell you, the common notation for that is to use pointed brackets around S. So you see, this new symbol is well defined and it turns out it's also a subgroup of G. This last part we can show soon, but first let's fix the manner of speaking. In an active form we say S generates this new subgroup. Hence this generation process we have already used above is explained. And with that we might have an efficient way to define some particular groups. But before we talk about examples, I would say let's clear up a gap in this definition. Indeed this proposition is easy to formulate, any intersection of subgroups is a subgroup again. So you see this is a very general thing, it does not work with the unions, but an intersection of subgroups is always a subgroup. And in fact, the proof is surprisingly easy. And in order to write it down, let's first fix the assumptions. So we have a group G and any collection of subgroups called UJ. This means here we have an index set capital J and it does not matter what this actually is. So in particular, it can be an infinite index set. And now let's use the name U tilde for the intersections of these subgroups UJ. So this is a well-defined set and now we want to show that this is also a subgroup in G. Now the first thing is obvious, we cannot have an empty set because the identity element E lies in all the subgroups. Therefore it also lies in the intersection, so U tilde is not the empty set. So the first thing for a subgroup is already satisfied, we have the identity element in it. 
And now as always, the only thing we have to show is that we cannot leave the subset u tilde with the group operation and the inverse operation. However, also that follows immediately from the intersection because we know we cannot leave the single sets uj. But by the definition of the intersection, we know that we lie in all of the uj's. Therefore, inside each uj, we can already use the fact that we have a subgroup there. This means A connected with B with the group operation cannot leave uj. And again, this holds no matter which lowercase j we consider. And moreover, we have exactly the same thing for the inverse operation, so A inverse also lies in uj. Obviously we have the same thing for B, but we don't need that, because now we have this claim for every j in j. Hence, by the definition of the intersection, a b lies in u tilde and a inverse as well. And that's already it. This shows us that u tilde is a subgroup. So this is a common thing to show a subgroup and you see it works in general for the intersection. And this shows us that we have indeed a subgroup in the definition above. And by looking at the construction, we can actually say that this generated subgroup is the smallest possible subgroup that still contains S. Okay, so now you might say, this is a very nice definition, it works very well, and it gives us actually the smallest possible subgroup. But how does it work in practice? Indeed, in practice, you would not just collect all possible subgroups and then form the intersection, because this is not very efficient. So let's talk about something we could take as an equivalent definition. However, there we should exclude the empty set, which is also not so interesting. I say that because obviously the smallest possible subgroup generated by the empty set is the smallest possible subgroup altogether, which is the one that only contains the unit element. Therefore, it's not a problem at all to exclude this trivial case here. Now, together with the elements of S, we also need their inverses, and I will denote that by s to the power minus 1. This is not so complicated, it's just the set of the inverses, so lowercase s to the power minus 1. And then we can just go through all possible cases in our set s. And now the idea is that we can just put all the elements of s and the inverses together to form new elements in the group g. This means you can just take any element a1, then you put it together with another element a2 by using the group operation as always. And then we continue this whole composition until we reach an element an. And that's it. And by definition we know this is definitely an element in our group g. And then we can just go through all possibilities to span the whole subgroup. So you see we have a finite number of elements we can combine, but this number can be as high as we want. This means you can go step by step, you combine 2, then you combine 3, and so on. The only restriction we have is that we only take elements from S or their inverses. So we can write that these elements A come from S union with S inverse. And that's it. This is the whole definition of the set we can generate by using our starting set S. So you see this is explicitly generating and it turns out that this is exactly our subgroup from before. Of course one has to concretely show the set inequality here, but for us it totally makes sense. The right hand side is what we actually mean by generating and what should come out is a subgroup. And by definition you see it has to be the smallest possible subgroup that contains our set S. Therefore, you might see that the actual proof for this equality is not so hard. So maybe let's see if we can use that right hand side in an example. And again, I will take the symmetric group as 3 because it's not commutative, but still small enough that we can write down all the elements. And there as in the introduction of the video, our set S just contains the two elements A and B. The one is a rotation and the other one a reflection. And now you might know we can immediately form the inverses, which are not so complicated. Indeed, the inverse of a is just a squared, and the inverse of b is b again. Hence, in this example, the inverse set does not give us more elements. 
Okay, and now we can just form all possible combinations, for example, A, B, B, A, and so on. And then we immediately see that B, B gives us the identity element. And now you know, if you remember the last video, that we can do more combinations, but we don't get more elements back. Indeed, after these steps, we already have all the six elements of S3. Therefore, in a short notation, you could write that S3 is generated by A and B. And usually inside the pointed brackets, we omit the set brackets if possible. So the nice result here is that S3 is only generated by two elements, which is a low number, but still it could be complicated to calculate the whole right hand side in general for two generators. We already see that problem in this small example, so maybe now imagine a really big group where we want to calculate the subgroup generated by two elements. So in general this is not simple at all, so the only easy case we can actually calculate quickly is when we only have one generator. And this finally leads us to the title of this video, a cyclic group. So let's immediately write down the definition, let's take a general group G. And this one is called cyclic if it's generated by just one element. So this means you can take a particular element G from the group capital G and then you construct the smallest possible subgroup that contains this element G. And then if it turns out that this subgroup is actually the whole set G, then we call G cyclic. So you could say this is a not so complicated group because it's determined completely by just one element. And actually, if we just have one element, this right hand side here is much simpler than the general case. Namely, we just have a combination of G with G inverse. Therefore, we can just write, take G to the power K, where K is an integer. Hence, a positive integer describes the element G itself and a negative one its inverse. And the particular case in the middle should be k is equal to zero, which should be the identity element. So you see, this is just a common short notation for a general group operation. So you see, we just have to apply the element g again and again to reach all the elements of g. Okay, so this is the explicit definition of a cyclic group, but we should definitely look at examples to see how such cyclic groups actually behave. However, there I think it's worth it to put it into a separate video, so I really hope I meet you there again. Have a nice day and bye bye.